You can't hope to save wildlife until you first save the rangers who are tasked with protecting the wildlife and the wild spaces within which they live. If I was not to become a ranger, people would be killing animals, you know, destroying nature such as trees and even other things, other nature that we see around. So I chose to become a ranger so that I can able to conserve nature. My name is Sport BT. I'm, I'm the founder of GRI. We started it back in 2008 and our mission is quite simple, it's to empower rangers and local communities to conserve nature. And, and we do that through a very simple model, which we call ranger empowerment, and it includes three key ingredients, which are welfare, training and operational support. So in terms of welfare, it's everything to do with that ranger's living and how well they are doing at home. Are they living in a, in a, a decent accommodation? Are their kids going to school? If the rangers get sick, can they have access to medical support so that when they step out of the door to go to work, they can concentrate on the job in front of them because it is quite a dangerous job. The second ingredient is all about training. So making sure the rangers have access to good training. So both basic field ranger training at the start of their careers, but then ongoing refresher training, advanced training and bespoke training for any specialized roles that the rangers have to perform. And this is to make sure that they remain professional, that they remain safe in the workspace, but also that they're efficient and they're effective in deploying their duties. And then finally, the third key ingredient that we provide is operational support. So this is everything the rangers need to do their jobs. It includes mobility, communication, and then rations, uniforms, technical support, etc., etc. I think it's very much important to be a ranger to conserve for the future generation. If you provide welfare, training and operational support to the rangers, they're able to do their jobs safely, efficiently and effectively. You can't hope to save wildlife until you first save the rangers. Sport, it's so great to have you joining us. Uh, you know, as for the first year of this festival celebrating World Ranger Day, I think the best place to start is, you know, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, thanks very much, Joe, and, and uh, very good morning to all your listeners and to your audiences. Um, just want to say thanks for having us on your platform. It's really great uh, that you're raising awareness for rangers, who I feel are probably one of the most important parts of wildlife conservation today. Um, my name is Sport Beatty. I'm the founder and chief executive for Game Rangers International. Um, our mission is to empower rangers and local communities to conserve nature. Uh, so that's based upon a very simple philosophy that we believe you can't save wildlife and wild spaces until you first save the men and women, i.e. the rangers, who are tasked to protect the wildlife and wild spaces and also the local communities living closest to the wildlife and wild spaces. So that's really how we approach our work. Um, we've been going now for 14 years. We predominantly work in Zambia, um, and a lot of our work is undertaken in the Kafui landscape. Um, and we split our work um, of empowering rangers into three distinct parts. So you have uh, wildlife rescue, we're supporting and empowering rangers in the wildlife rescue space, in the community outreach space, and also in the resource protection space. Uh, so we take an holistic approach to wildlife conservation, and we've seen that where those three things overlap, you get maximum impact for wildlife and wild spaces. So that's that's who we are. That's what we do. Thank you. All right. Well, let's get, uh, before we maybe dive into a little bit more of, of the rangers and their work, let's get, uh, you know, a little a little bit personal for a moment. I'd love to hear a little bit about what led to the formation of Game Rangers International? Um, <clears throat> I think it was really just um, firsthand 
knowledge and experience observations just seeing how you know a lot of us expect wildlife you know just to be looked after and we feel incredulous sometimes when we see elephants being poached or, or rhinos getting their, their faces chopped off but it's very easy for us to forget about the men and women who have to go out every day <clears throat> pardon me into very challenging conditions to actually protect and secure the wildlife um, and I just wanted to clarify that rangers are not just those men and women who got who are armed. It's you know it's it's everybody who's providing the back end support, the drivers, the cooks, um, the researchers, the the keepers. So there's a whole ecosystem of rangers. But what made us start Game Rangers International is just seeing that the rangers were not well supported, but there was a very high expectation of them to protect the wildlife and the wild spaces. So our role is really to find find the gaps, find the needs, and to see how we can come in and support government and local communities to empower their rangers to be able to do their jobs more safely, more efficiently, and more effectively. Yeah, I'm glad you brought up, uh, you know, that there are so many more roles to being a ranger. I think, uh, you know, it's definitely kind of a stereotype, security, 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 but there, you know, it's much, much more to the role and working in the community. Um, and one that you mentioned is kind of one of those three kind of main areas that kind of overlap is wildlife rescue. So I'm wondering, you know, what, what could a typical, typical wildlife rescue call kind of look like for, for a ranger? Oh, it can vary so much, hey, uh, Joe. So in, our, in one of our examples, our, our focus when we started the wildlife rescue element of Game Rangers International was based on, at the time, there was quite a high level of elephant poaching. And so, you know, when poachers shoot an elephant, they don't really care if they shoot a female or a big bull. Obviously, they want as much ivory as they can get. But very often, a female would get shot. And if she's lactating, you know, the, the elephant calf is left behind as an orphan. So we were called upon to see how we could support rangers to first and foremost rescue those orphaned elephants. Um, and then once you've rescued them, you know, it's a case of rehabilitating them and ultimately releasing them back into the wild where they belong. It's a very long process. Um, we only get involved in wildlife rescue operations when it's um, because of a human intervention. So for example, if a lion was to tackle a zebra and break the zebra's leg, we wouldn't get involved in that because that's nature. But because humans do poaching and there's human wildlife conflict, wherever wildlife and animals sort of butt heads, there's this conflict. And, and oftentimes out of that conflict come these rescue, um, these rescue needs. And that's, that's where we step in and support the rangers to be able to go in and, and do their job as best as they can. Yeah. So, you know, you, you talked a little bit about the rangers, it, it, it's a tough job, it's a demanding job, but it, it's something that I know, you know, they're really passionate about doing. What do you think it is that drives uh, rangers, you know, to, to work through these tough con conditions, often not getting the recognition that they, they very much deserve? What do you think drives them and keeps them going? It's a really good question. Um, I think just based on my experience and observations, oftentimes, people will opt to become a ranger just because sometimes there's just nothing else for them to do. Um, but as they get into the job and as they, you know, because it's really difficult training and, you know, then the, the, the working conditions are really hard, but they form up into these really cohesive teams. And I think it's the team spirit and the morale that, that really motivates them to keep going and to try and overcome and stand, you know, stand boldly in front of some of those challenges. Of course, there are a lot of people, and, and we're seeing it more in the younger generations. Um, some of those younger people that we've had interactions with over the last 14 years, raising awareness to, to, to you know, the younger generations. As they've come out of school, they've, they've wanted to become rangers because they are more passionate, um, and they understand the value and importance of conserving wildlife. So you've got a bit of a, a, bit of a mix of why people perhaps join to become a ranger, but once you are a ranger, you can't but be passionate because it is such a demanding job that if you're not passionate, you're probably better off going farming or, or doing something much easier. Not to say farming is easy, but you know what I mean. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And uh, I think, you know, you touched on another good point there about community and uh, being out in the community. So I know that's a big role uh, for rangers, being out in the community. 
do you, do you think the Rangers find themselves stepping into the role of educator a lot? Absolutely. Even even when we intercept poachers, you know, it's important that we try to educate the poachers themselves as to why they shouldn't be doing what they're doing and, you know, some of the risks involved, including, you know, the sentences and all that sort of stuff. But very much uh, Rangers go into the local communities um, and it's their role to help raise awareness first to the younger generations, but also to the adults. And that's just part and parcel of the job. But we also have dedicated education rangers who go out every day. We empower them with motorbikes and teaching materials. They interact, each education ranger interacts with 25 schools and two teachers in each of those schools, so 50 teachers in total. Um, and their role is to raise awareness uh, on a weekly basis to the kids. So it's done as an after-school activity. And like I mentioned just now, is some of those kids have actually come through this, the schooling system and have opted to become rangers themselves, which is really encouraging for us and is, and is one of our big successes, I believe. Yeah, I love that. I love hearing that, you know, education rangers out reaching the next generation. Um, and, you know, I think, I think that's, that, that, that's what it's all about is, is empowering students, letting them know what's happening, letting them know how they can be involved um, and just providing them with such great role models. I think, you know, take down the, the sports players and the, the pop star posters off the walls. There should be more Rangers up on walls uh, in some of those classrooms and some of those students. I, I love hearing about that and, and how they're getting out in the classroom uh, yeah. and interacting. Yeah. yeah, and I think that one of the great things for me, Joe, is that over the years, you know, from when we started, you know, even the fact that we're having this conversation and, and that you've, you know, helping to raise awareness, there's just such a such a big wave of support that's coming in now, which is really wonderful because I think the Rangers are the forgotten heroes. You know, you don't see them because they're out there, um, but it's really great that we're seeing much more um, awareness being brought to the forefront, um, not just in the Western world, but also, you know, in places right close to where the protected areas are. So that's very encouraging and it bodes well for the future. Yeah. And I think, you know, uh, touching on that awareness, I think, the last year and a half has, has been really tough uh, for Rangers around the world with COVID. Um, and so recognition and support, I think, you know, is more important than ever right now. Um, can you tell me a little bit about some of the challenges, you know, Rangers have faced in Zambia the, the last year, year and a half? Yeah, perhaps I can't speak for all Rangers in Zambia, but certainly the ones that we empower. First, I just want to say, we, you know, we feel really blessed and, and lucky that all of our wonderful donors have stood by us throughout COVID. Um, and so just touch wood, we've, you know, we've still managed to get our normal levels of funding. And in some cases, we've, you know, we've received new streams of funding. And that's been a real godsend for us because there was, of course, and there still is a big worry about what might happen because tourism has pretty much come to a standstill. Um, so there's just much less eyes and ears in the bush. You know, the tourists also help to, to look into the bush and find problems and they report them to us. So we don't have those unpaid policemen going around. Um, but for the rangers themselves, yeah, it's been tough. I mean, we've had to implement lots of mitigation measures, both in our camps, the way we move between our camps, just to try and help stop the spread of the virus. Uh, I think in Zambia as a whole, we've been very lucky that the government has taken a very pragmatic and logical approach to mitigating the virus. So all those factors that have come together have enabled us to, I would say, continue our operations almost at 100%. Um, but of course, no one knows what the future holds just yet. We, we all just pray that COVID is um, coming under control, mostly, um, and, and yeah, we can get back to a sense of normality, hopefully. All right. Well, you have uh, you know, a, a close partnership with the Department of National Parks uh, and wildlife, uh, how does that help uh, aid in the work that you're trying to do, that close relationship? Yeah, I mean, it's critical to, to us being able to do our work and provide the support. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, we, we're just here to empower the rangers. Um, so it's actually national park rangers who are on the government payroll or local community rangers who are on the community payroll who we empower. And so our agreement with government and with the local communities is that they pay the salaries and all the statutory payments and we provide the rest um, and we provide three key ingredients to all of the ranges we empower and those are uh, welfare so making sure that 
all their welfare needs are taken care of as best as we can. Are they living in good accommodation? Are their kids going to school? Do they have access to uh, life insurance, medical insurance, et cetera, et cetera? We really want, when those rangers step out of their homes in the morning, they need to really focus on the job in front of them because it is dangerous. And if they're worrying about you know, what's behind them, whether their kids are going to school or whether if their wife is not well, has she been able to get to the hospital? So we need to take care of all of that. We also need to, as the second ingredient, provide them with all the training that they need uh, right from basic training through to advanced training and any bespoke or specialized training so that they can do their job safely and professionally. And then the third key ingredient we provide is operational support. So that's everything from mobility, vehicles, boats, bicycles, motorbikes, airplanes where we can, um, communications, so have they got radio comms, um, rations, patrol equipment, uniforms, technical support. So all the all those things have to come um, into one space to make sure that we can empower the rangers as, as well as we can. Um, not just the frontline rangers, the, you know, the, the ones carrying the rifles, but also the support rangers, the drivers, the cooks, the mechanics, the accountants, you know, all of those people play a very important role in being able to conserve wildlife and wild spaces. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, uh, you know, you mentioned the training um, that that the rangers go through. Can you know? I think a little bit about the training is probably new to a lot of people who might be tuning in. Um, you know, and learning a bit more about rangers working around the world. What is it? Is it a set amount of time, or is training more something that's constantly happening throughout a ranger's career? Yeah, so we we would love that it was something happening throughout their career, so that they would be receiving refresher training every year or at least every second year, they would be getting access to bespoke training, you know, to really get them to be much more professional and safe in their roles. Um, but of course, a lot of that requires funding. And as we as we get better at raising funding and as we continue to raise awareness, we hope that we'll be able to bring those types of initiatives um, into, into reality. Um, but at the moment, it's a fixed amount of training. So they go through quite a stringent selection process uh, for example, if we if we put out the word that we wish to empower, say, 20 new rangers, we would get at least 200, 300 applicants from the local communities. So we always try and hire from the local communities. They go through a rigorous selection process, uh, and then we'll send those rangers uh, to, the, to the ranger training, which can last anywhere from three to six months, and it's a grueling training process. Um, so they graduate out of the basic training, basic field ranger training, um, and they go straight into their roles. Um, what we're seeing, unfortunately, is a lot of the rangers that we are empowering or that we come across haven't had any refresher training for 5, 10, even 15 years. And so, you know, that's that's not really good. So our role is to see how we can change that and make it better. Yeah, and do you find... You know, when when you when you do speak with those rangers uh, who have been out of training for a while, say five, ten years, is that kind of high on their list? They they really, you know, like to be taking more training and and kind of advancing. Absolutely, and and this is the great thing about all the rangers that we work with is they just have this hunger and this desire to learn as much as they can to do you know to become better rangers. So as much support as we can provide, they they just absorb it. Um, and they want more and they want more, which which is really encouraging. And, you know, we've seen rangers that we've started working with, you know, who have really elevated and are doing some amazing work out in the field. Yeah. Oh, absolutely great. Great work that Game Rangers International is doing. I think that welfare piece is so, so important. Um, I think that's, that, that's kind of a common theme is, um, you know, less stress at home and, uh, in your personal life definitely helps with the job and uh, and kind of helps keep that focus. So uh, great to hear about the welfare support um, provided with the Rangers. So, you know, I it, it's a tough job. Um, and I imagine, you know, your role as the founder and CEO of the group, it's, it's probably tough and stressful for you. You're always kind of thinking about um, new projects and, um, you know, finding funds to support the work. So, you know, I, I'd love to hear about uh, something, you know, a, a victory, something big or small that, you know, those little moments that kind of feed and kind of keep you going in the work that you're doing. Yeah, I mean, there's been so many um, moments and, and successes, to be honest, over the years that 
I could I could name a whole list, but I think on a day-to-day -day basis, just watching the sun go down on a personal level is what sort of gives me that little bit of um, tonic to to you know tackle the the following day. But, but probably one of the more recent successes I can think of, uh, just to share with the audience, is um, we we had a double rescue that we undertook last year. So uh, two herds of elephants had gone into the local communities and were crop raiding. You know, and these elephants are destroying people's livelihoods. In the old days, um, well, you know, in, in years gone by, the community would have, um, you know, tried to kill those elephants and any elephants that were left behind, especially the little ones, they would certainly have killed them. But a success for us was that um, when that herd went into the community, they were chased out. Uh, and unfortunately, two of the youngest elephants were left behind. And rather than killing those elephants, the local community who we've been working very closely with, um, they decided to rescue those uh, which were now orphaned elephants. And they called us and said, look, there's two orphaned elephants here. Please, can you come and see what you can do? So ourselves and the Department of National Parks rushed to the scene. And sure enough, there were two orphaned elephants that the community were looking after uh, until we got there. Um, but why I mention that is it just demonstrates success at the community level. You know, we have lots of successes in terms of catching poachers and recovering illegal firearms and removing snares from the bush. But once you get the local community on sides, you really start to see big changes um, in what's happening in wildlife conservation. Because if the local communities are not bought into this whole conservation, then it's never going to work. Uh, so that that was a good success for us. Um, but as I say, there's there's been so many. and. You know, just want to mention that none of what we do and certainly none of what I'm able to do would be possible with without the amazing team we have in GRI. Yeah, so that we're very blessed with that. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, speaking of team, what what is the size of the the group of rangers that you are supporting? Yeah, so we started uh, with five rangers. Um, um, what was that, 14 years ago? We, we now support... 254 rangers wow. and it's a, a mixture of uh, people who are on our payroll who are more of the support rangers so the cooks the drivers mechanics accountants technical advisors etc and um, and then 150 odd frontline rangers and um, our goal is to get to 500 rangers in the next three to five years oh that's great that's great yeah. and then are you starting to find um more more females starting to join the ranger force Yes, and that's very encouraging as well. You know, when I started, you'd see the odd female ranger, but she was really a sort of posted to a more of an administration type role. Now we have female rangers who are, you know, working on the front line. We've got a whole, an all female ranger team in our control room who are operating probably some of the most sophisticated technology in protected areas, certainly in Zambia. Um, and so yeah, it's a very encouraging sign to see more female rangers or more, more, um, females wanting to become rangers. And again, mostly in the younger generations, and, and we would hope that some of that is because of the awareness we raised um, in amongst the schools over the yeah. last decade and a bit, yeah. Oh, excellent, yeah, that's great. Um, love hearing uh, things like that, it, it's very exciting. And um, yeah, they're, uh, I bet they're just an amazing team and uh, hopefully that part of the, the workforce continues to grow as well. Yeah. Um, you know, talking just community one more time, uh, and you sh you did share that story where you know how how the feelings change, how the um, you know kind of that shift towards protection, um, and I think I think most people are really proud of where they're from and their their wildlife, and they don't like to see um, you know it lost, but sometimes circumstance, um, you know, economic circumstance and such. Uh, you know, can be a real driver. So that's that's why I think training and empowering rangers to work in the, in the communities is just such a such a powerful piece. And yeah, um, yeah, I, I I think I think it's absolutely great. So uh, hats off again to the work that uh, uh, Game Rangers International is doing. And you know, that brings me to kind of uh, a bit of a wrap up and talking about support. And you know, what 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 is it that over the next few years, where is the most support needed? Is it Funding in general, is it, you know, more tourism dollars kind of coming into the, the country? Where's where's most of the support needed? 
Yeah, I think sort of, you know, at the field level in country, definitely we need those things. You know, funding is is really our Achilles tendon. And, and that's the same for all conservation groups mostly. Um, so, yeah, th those are the obvious things. But I, I think what, what really needs to change and, and what is changing, I, I do feel that one of the positives of COVID, one could say, is that people are seemingly more in tune with, with the planet um, and their surroundings. And I, I really think what needs to change is we as people, as humans, we need to decide how we want to live on this planet. I mean, that's and that's within everybody's capacity to ask that question of themselves and to start being the change that they want to see. Because if we all make little changes in our lives, it will have, you know, a huge butterfly effect for the whole planet. And I know that that sounds sort of up there in the clouds, but that, that's really what's got to happen, in my opinion. We, we can continue, you know, sort of holding the front line and protecting the protected areas, but it's, it's so tenuous and it's balancing on a knife edge. And until us as a human race decide how we want to live on this planet, I think that's really the change that is needed, and, it, and it's needed soon. Absolutely no question. Biodiversity loss is a massive issue uh you know we're facing around the world you could argue you know it's a reason why we're in the situation we are in coming more in contact with wildlife losing kind of those natural buffers and resiliency and so it just makes the work of the rangers even more critical being on the front line of protecting our biodiversity you know all around the world so obviously a shout out to rangers everywhere shout out to rangers in zambia and sport to you and your whole team at game rangers international thank you for the work you do uh supporting rangers and making sure they can do you know what they do best passionate out there in the community and and making a real difference on the ground thanks very much joe and it's been a real pleasure to to speak with you today and, and again thank you for helping us to raise awareness of the importance of the role rangers play not just on the front line but you know right back into the support end as well thank you all right thanks for have a great rest of your day yeah you too thanks very much cheers